Hey guys, Boy here, and this is Things I've Learned with Artesis Terrorblade in 719. Terrorblade as of now is one of the highest win rate heroes in high level Dota, while also being one of the most speed heroes there. This hero is insanely strong right now, and we'll see how Artesis crushes a game while being completely dismantled in the laning stage. This game ended in 30 minutes, yet if you watch the first 5, you would be sure it was over for Arthur. His initial items are quite standard, a bunch of regen and some extra stats, the branches really help versus Undying, that he knows will be chasing him. As you can see, Undying is already here, and Artisa decides that switching lanes might be the right idea. He walks bottom, and that's why scouting your lanes as fast as possible is important. It allows you to walk instead of TP to your lane of preference. Ursa showed top at the start, and since he didn't feel that Artisa was leaving the lane, he was forced to walk all the way bottom. While he can TP when Artisa leaves the lane with TP as well, he lost two creep waves because he actually walked to the bottom lane. Look at this lane, though. Artizi already used Metamorphosis bottom, and all he can do is try and leech experience. While he doesn't die right away, look what ensues. He doesn't get CS at all, gets zoned out of experience range, and burns through a lot of region. One important thing to take away from this early game is his build. This lane is ruthless, and Arthur doesn't have the supports to help him with this lane. So trying to get points in Q to battle those heroes will not help at all. In fact, Arthur went 0 4 4 with no points in Sunder. He recognizes that he will jungle this game and already preps for it. Another important factor that a lot of frustrated safe laners forget is that when they're playing like this, they should not farm the small camp. That's one of the few instruments you have to control your farm, and thus even though Arthur is level 2, he goes for this medium camp as he waits for the shaker to pull. He farms the small camp, but after pulling, and they do not connect the pull. Not only Radiant can contest it, this pull is way more about having the creeps close to his tower than to equalize the creep equilibrium. This concept is only meaningful when you actually have control over the safe lane, which is quite clear they don't have here. That guarantees Arthur is level 3, and with meta ready, they actually go for an aggressive play. This is a decent power spike, he gets the tombstone and some decent control over the lane. After the meta ends though, Artizi's only hope is jungling again. Note how he doesn't farm the small camp, he resorts to the medium camp while the support pulls and we see the same thing going on and on again. I think going back to the creep wave was one of the few mistakes he did this game, while there is a catapult there, he's against a nurse that with face boots ready, I guess he just clicked it too late. He explodes in a second although the shaker was able to get a kill on the Ursa which is nice. And And he goes back to the lane just to be sure that the catapult is dead, knowing that Tombstone is not ready and it's harder for him to dive him again. After that though, he's ready to abandon ship. Jungling with Terror Blade is not hard, but there's a couple of tricks to be aware of. First of all, don't tank too much creep damage, and if you're doing, make sure you have tangles with yourself. You can have two illusions up at a time, so make sure that your illusion closer to dying is the one taking the creep damage, or else you're gonna lose a very healthy illusion, and then you're gonna be jungling with zero illusions. Try to get some stacks when you can, because thanks to Metamorphosis, that you're not gonna be using for tower pushing in a game like this, you can actually farm it later. Another thing to remember is to have your support leeching experience in the lane that you left and to aid other lanes if a tower is in danger and you don't think you can die when you're helping. Since Artizi sees the Ursa going ham in the top lane, he also knows he's safe here, and then he rotates to farm this ancient camp. This is a safe area since he has vision of the heroes in the enemy safe lane, but more important than knowing where to farm, look how he handles the prowlers. You don't have insane damage output right now, so you want to focus the small ones because they offer HP regen to the other ones. He also micros the illusion that was about to die, so he tanks the root attack while also clearing the camp before minute 8. Thanks to the clarity, he can keep spamming illusions to farm later. At the same time though, note how he changes his mind instantly when he goes mid to farm. He sees the last track. That hero can destroy Arthur, especially because he did not learn Sunder. So he doesn't bother defending the tower, because he's probably getting dove. In a game like this, going for the standard treads into Dragonlance is almost always the best build. Dragonlance gives you the highest HP per gold of any item besides treads early on, and it also gives you attack range and agility, so just a well-balanced, stat-efficient item that can become a Hurricane Pike later if you want to, since you're against two gap-closing heroes. Note that every time a fight starts, Arteezy tries to squeeze some CS in a lane, but never for too long. He also doesn't want to maintain creep equilibrium, he wants to shove the waves so heroes show up and he knows where to farm later. A cool trick he goes for here is after the tower drew aggro to his creeps, sending the illusions forward to intercept the next creep wave. This means extra damage to the tower while he also gets CS. As he pushes the creep waves away from the tier 2, look how self-conscious he is. Any hero plus Nature's Prophet might be able to kill him. Ursa plus Undying were showing, then PA shows, and after seeing Lash mid, he finally knows this is a safe creep wave to go for. 
he constantly sends the illusions to the range creep after the aggro to a lane creep, because that creep is the one that pushes the wave the fastest. It's also the weakest creep that gives more gold. Make sure to do it constantly, and you're gonna see that it's very hard for the enemy to actually push against you. Another great signature move that Arteezy does is the Shrine TP for stack plus far. He loves doing these as Fan, Rip, and the Terror Blade works wonders too. Not only he's pushing top very hard with a catapult, he's farming this ancient knowing that he's safe. There's a lot of efficiency tricks like him drawing aggro with the illusions while he finishes a camp. Also note that as he farmed there, his teammates spot a smoke gang from Radiant that was probably looking for Arthur. Knowing that, he scans and since he's sure about it, he goes all the way back to the base. This is not optimal, but this is also not an optimal game. By sending his illusions mid, he also kind of forces Radiant to either show up and start pushing other lanes, or to keep looking to no avail. By also going back to the base, he's sure that the smoke ended, and he can reset and avoid Radiant's next move. Three heroes were showing bottom, two top, so he decides to go mid. Radiant really wants him though, and even with this mega tanky build, he falls. Note how he plays though. As soon as the Ursa shows up, he thread switches for strength. Ursa was very smart and wanted to hide until the Sunder was used. Arteezy is forced to ult the Undyne, and one thing that might go unnoticed here is that his illusions are actually dealing with the Tombstone. Not only he gets 175 gold before falling thanks to the Thread Switch and this insanely tanky build, they trade 3 for 2. Actually, if we wait a little bit, 4 for 2. So yes, he dies, but not only he was tanky enough that his team was able to respond, so he farmed very, very well, and even though he died, he was tanky enough to get a lot of kills for his team, he even farms the tombstone. Arteezy uses multiple distraction tactics after he responds. First of all, he sends an illusion top. It makes sense, since it's the creep wave closer to him, but it also might trick Radiant into thinking he's in the top jungle. Note how that illusion gets 3 CS, taking the range creeps instantly, they pushing the wave very effectively. As it happens, he's also sending an illusion bottom with his hero, and this might look dangerous, but he asked his shaker to be close to him. Leshrac felt like he could get a solo kill on Arteezy, and he was right, but Arteezy was not alone. Since he walked when he respawned, he can now pressure this lane, knowing someone will address it, while he goes top. He knows that Ursa is showing, and thus it's unlikely that at this stage, he can die against the other heroes having Sunder almost ready. That being said, he doesn't show in lane because of the cooldown. He just sends an illusion, and since he has meta, he farms the ancients he stacked 10 minutes ago, while his illusions clear the way. He gets another stack there, and even though he's low HP, he knows the shrine is close, and he goes for it. Another efficiency tip is him making an illusion before leaving the fountain, and already sending it top, a lane he's not going for. Not only he can always address a lane he doesn't want to be in, his illusions don't need to be full HP to actually hit the creeps, so he's going to be affecting the map faster. He goes for another farming metamorphosis, a good rule of thumb on Terror Blade when you're playing from behind is fighting after you get your defensive items or your level 15 talent, ideally both. The 300 HP really makes this hero harder to bring down, so as long as Arteezy is being good at the pushing waves, he's not going to be forced into a scenario Radiant wants to push and he has no metamorphosis. As Arteezy finishes the Radiant Ancient camp, they're going crazy in the top lane. These are the lanes where there's no Radiant hero to clear his illusions, so he sends his illusions to the mid and the bottom lane while he keeps on farming. As he finishes the Manta, Lash is mid, a bunch of heroes are bottom, and top is where he goes to. Note that even with Akela and Crystal Maiden Aura, this hero is very mana hungry, and does Arteezy make sure to get clarities going, so he's always in optimal shape and can always use illusions. He also has that self stored that will play a big role in this game, so keep watching. Arteezy has his Shaker around, and he spots both Ursa and Lash in lanes showing. This is a good kill.
Not only Artisi gets level 15, he has the cell to regen after the Wrath of Nature, giving him full confidence to abuse the Manta plus 15 power spike. Usually, if you commit Manta to just kill an Undying, that's a terrible trade, but since he has the cell, he can actually regen and get towers afterwards. This is one of the very few moments he played this aggressive, and it makes a lot of sense. As this happens, his storm is showing bottom, revealing more heroes, just giving him full confidence in this move, and he goes for it. He went from not having a lane and jungling from the early game to the highest farm hero in this game. At this stage, Artizi doesn't need to send illusions to the lane and jungle. Not only he feels very strong, even without meta, he has Sunder and Radiant was fighting top. He has the chance to enable the siege creep wave way more, so he actually gets into the Radiant jungle, pushing one extra wave before backing off while he now makes use of the Radiant Ancients and sends an illusion with that wave. Not only he's denying farm from Radiant, he's opening safe farm to his allies. As that happens, his illusions cuts the Radiant jungle, not only giving vision, but cutting the Radiant creep wave. The level 15 power spike also means one single illusion can most likely solo kill a creep wave if you start from the range creep, which Arthur didn't, but still makes a pretty big dent on that creep wave. Interestingly enough, Artizi did not go BKB this game. The only real lockdown Radiant has is the Youth Scepter, and Lash will not build BKB in the near future, so he has a bunch of allies to make sure that the stun never lands. And against everything else, Manta is actually a great dispel here. Even better, all of the burst damage Radiant has is physical, so the Butterfly not only makes sure that one fight that they win means at least two lanes of barracks, it also makes him a very powerful threat in teamfights. Certainly enough, the fight comes quickly. Shaker was following Artizi everywhere, giving him the chance of killing Undyne again, and here, Loco uses the illusion to give Shaker the vision to play aggressive once again. Also important to know that Arthur never used the Manta to push faster. Taking the slows out from Dagger and Earthshock is important, and since he has that Eagle Song, he has more than enough pushing power. Even here, he doesn't Manta. Only after this dagger in Tubestone, he pops the item to take that structure as fast as possible. They take the first line of barracks, and this game is pretty much over already. From a, a, from a rough early start to a 20 minute barracks. Quite impressive, actually. As of always, guys, make sure to like and subscribe if you liked this video. If you didn't like, please be as insightful and in depth as possible in the comment section. And I mean, if you like it as well, I, I don't know, just say something. It really helps. This is probably gonna be the last video in a while because I'm gonna be traveling to ESL Hamburg. I'm gonna be in the JDL studio casting the close qualifiers with Moxie. That's gonna be awesome. We're gonna be covering the North American region. So please guys, if you can watch, I would like any feedback. This is gonna be my biggest event ever. And right now I'm not very confident on how I'm gonna do. And I know there's gonna be a lot of mistakes. So please make sure to point them out so that I can fix them later. As of always guys, if you wanna know what's going on in my life, follow me on Twitter. If you want to help me, follow me on Twitch. Sub there if you want to. I'm streaming constantly. I'm trying to cast games on YouTube and Twitch, but I'm only playing on Twitch because I like to listen to music. And if I actually post the stream with music on YouTube, it's going to get demonetized, which sucks. If you want to know what's going on in the JDL studio, if you want to see some pictures from behind the scenes, follow me on Instagram as well. And I guess that's it, guys. Thanks for watching. Bye.